Okay, we're live. It is Thursday, October 1st, the first day in known as Breast Cancer Awareness Month, shortened for BCAM, for those of you who like initials. And um, it's October 1st, as I said, and we are delighted to have Melanie Young, a motivational muse on the topics of career, life, reinvention, entrepreneurship, and brand building, but most importantly, a breast cancer survivor since 2009, who has written an amazing book called Getting a Few Things Off My Chest. This is the, can you see it? The third edition. And I want to share before we start talking to Melanie that when I received my diagnosis on Friday, April 1st, 2005, the first thing I thought was, where do I go to get information? And a friend who had been diagnosed a few years earlier, I called her in tears and she brought over the Susan Love Breast book, which was a wonderful book. It stayed by my bedside for months, but it was very clinical and very medical. And I wanted to hear from somebody who had walked through my shoes. And so when Melanie shared with me that she was starting this third edition and I read some of the chapters uh, before it was published, I decided this is the volume that you need for the newly diagnosed, and it is a primer for practically every question you might have from diagnosis to recovery. And I suggest what happens when somebody gets breast cancer, people will call Melanie, they'll call me, any other survivor, and they say, what do I do to help my friend, my mother, my sister, my sister-in-law, my cousin, my aunt? This is what you do. For $20, this book will take this person from diagnosis to recovery and beyond. So welcome, Melanie. Um, we met in 2014 at Survivorville, a conference in Nashville, Tennessee, and have stayed in touch every, ever since. A couple other interesting facts about Melanie. She is the founder of the James Beard Awards for foodies, and she and her husband, David Ransom, have a, a radio program called The Connected Table. So if you ever want to know anything about food or wine, Melanie is your girl. So Melanie, welcome. Molly, it's great to see you. Yeah, so briefly, just talk about the food and beverage industry and what you, I, I do remember that you said that you knew you were, you were so pressured with the work that you were doing in PR and marketing and traveling the world that you felt you really hadn't taken care of your diet and you wondered if that might have been a contributor to your diagnosis. So Absolutely. what changes did you make? Because diet's a big part. And what do you recommend women do? Well, I was overworked and my first recommendation is never put your health second. Always put your health first. It's the best investment you can make to stay healthy. And I believe in a whole approach. It's not only what you eat, but managing how you take care of yourself and manage what is eating you, i.e. stress management. I was highly stressed. And while it does not cause cancer, it makes you your body go toxic and your metabolism awry, which was what had happened to me. I would gained weight. I was highly stressed. I wasn't moving. It's so important to get 45 to 60 minutes of movement a day. And it's still challenging because we all work hard and we're all at home working in front of a computer all day. And of course, having a healthy diet and adequate amounts of sleep and what I what we call hug time, community time. So you're not isolated. And this is like a whole this is like your whole portion control, your lifestyle diet. It's like making sure every part of your lifestyle is balanced, not just what you eat, but the whole picture. And you have a whole chapter on this in the book. I do. It was very important because I truly did ask, because when you're diagnosed, you go, how did this happen? What did I do wrong? And don't play the blame game. I don't advise it. Don't do it, but you do it. And I actually believe that my workaholic way, which is still hard to keep in control, and my rich diet and you know, it was, it's wonderful, uh, was a contributing factor because I wasn't, I was ignoring the warning signs and Molly, they were there. They were there. I was uh, overweight. I felt my system was off. I was prone to rashes and gastrointestinal issues. And then I was diagnosed with breast cancer on top of it all. So you described earlier when we were talking about this breast cancer journey, some people don't like that word. They don't like to call it a journey, but it is kind of a, you have a start, a destination at the end where you're recovered. You hope, wish, think, and pray. You talked about it like being Dorothy in the land of Oz. Can you share that analogy with people? Because I think it's a great word picture. 
and and Molly throughout getting things off my chest, there are references to get uh, the Wizard of Oz. So it's one of my favorite uh, movies of all time and stories. But I always was the traveler who wanted to leave home and see the world and go places. And suddenly, I, the passionate traveler, was in a a distant land that I was not familiar with and, and didn't want to be in, kind of like Dorothy when she, she upended and landed in Oz and she just wanted to get out of there and home somewhere safe. And along the way, I had a little dog. My Toto was my dog, Chance. And the symbolism of the Wizard of Oz is this. There was the scarecrow, which was the scarecrow wanted a brain. I was heavily impacted by chemo brain. It, I, it took me by surprise. I address it in the book because no one told me about chemo brain. And it's a reality. Um, I My heart, I wanted a healthy heart because I was worried about my heart throughout chemo. And I also wanted to be loved because you, you want to be loved and be told you're beautiful throughout the whole experience. Fortunately, my husband, David, did that for me. And of course, what was the lion? Courage. I just wanted to have courage. And of course, the Wicked Witch was cancer. And the Great Oz was my oncologist. And the Good Witch was my wonderful uh, surgeon, Dr. Alexander Heert, who sounded like the Good Witch in Oz. And of course, all I want to do was go home again. And once I got there, I realized that there was no place like home. And I would appreciate myself and everything around me better. So it does take a lot of courage um, yeah. when, you're, when you get this diagnosis, you don't know what you don't know. And um, as a mother of five, I remember that book that came out in the 90s that said what to expect when you're expecting. So what to expect when you get this diagnosis? You said you have five commandments for getting organized at the very start. How does this help you know what to expect when you have a breast cancer diagnosis? Well, of course, because everybody will call when they find out that you have cancer, everybody will give you the names of surgeons and doctors. And a lot of them aren't even where you live, <laughs> like you're going to go take a train somewhere. But you got to get organized. And I approached my cancer uh, thanks to a good friend who brought me a list of questions to ask the doctor. She, her name was Melanie. She came down and sat with me. She brought me an organizational binder and a list of questions. And that made me feel very prepared. And I decided that when I was going to write this book, I would start with how to manage the business of cancer, because we all know it's a disease, but it's also a business called healthcare. And what's the most important thing you need to know? Commandment one, how does your health insurance work? Do you know what's covered, what's not, what's in network? What's not? So the third call I made when I was diagnosed, the first was David, my husband. The second was my friend, Melanie, who came down to help me out and sit with me. And the third was Howard Goldstein, my health insurance guy. And I said, I need a list of questions to ask and understand. And that became the basis of everything I did in the book. How are you going to pay for everything? What, is your, what are your finances like? Commandment two, get your finances in order, right? Call all your creditors and credit card companies and ask for higher limits understand how your insurance works, how you're going to pay for your treatment with, you know, the out of pocket. Thank God for people like the pink, you know, organizations like the pink fund. How are you going to communicate this to all your different constituencies, your, your work, your coworkers, your boss, your friends, your family, your children, right? Uh, get your key uh, facts in order. Cause when you go to the doctor, every doctor, they're going to ask you about recent surgeries, your supplements, not only your supplements and vitamins, but how large or small the dosage is, recent surgeries. You've got to have a whole dossier. It's like your resume on your health. That's commandment four. And commandment five is create a very supportive peer network, people that you can count on to be your caregivers and your sharegivers and the people you can lean on. It's not always your family. It may not be your spouse or your mom or your dad. They may not be able to take it. It's got to be someone who can take in the good and the bad. I know that Dr. Love says you want to take in your, um, I think she says, no holds barred, won't leave without getting an answer friend. Because if you take in an advocate and you're afraid to speak for yourself, because many patients are concerned that if they question the doctor, that the doctor is not going to give them the best treatment or pass them off to somebody else. And so to have that advocate who in many cases probably isn't a family member because they're afraid for you and for them, um, you know, find, find that, that person who's really aggressive. 
And very we'll, aggressive. My yeah. uh, brother-in-law just had stem cell transplant, transplant and his his wife is a pit bull. In fact, I yeah. think she's you know, she's a pit bull. But you want that you want that fighter, and you don't want to go to the doctor's appointments alone because this is what it sounds like. My man, my man, 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 kind of like cancer, and mm -hmm. and it's like you hear every third word, kind of like Charlie Brown's teacher, the peanut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's important to and ask if you can record the conversation. Yes. I asked to um, to have pictures drawn because I wanted to see what the cancer looked like because I'm a visual person. So I still have my diagram from my oncologist who explained all the different things going on in both breasts. And so are some of these questions in this book that you suggest? Yes. Okay. So every, really every, every chapter has a question, lists of questions and a list of tips okay. and how they were vetted. Um, I, at first, the tips are from survivors. I interviewed dozens and dozens of survivors and they share, you know, what it, and the question was, what did you wish you had known when yeah. you were going through this that you want to share with this person who's reading this book? So that was number one. And then every chapter is vetted by an expert in their field to make sure it's accurate and they provide insights. And one of my favorite chapters was on skincare. And my dentist, I went to my dentist and I said, Dr. Mignani, what's gonna happen with my teeth? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that can happen with chemo in your teeth yeah. and, and the mouth sores. So he gave me an incredible list of things to consider and check and ask. And then um, Dr. Mario Locature uh, from Memorial Sloan Kettering wrote what I think is the definitive book on skincare and cancer. And so he uh, and I vetted that chapter. A lot of it, you know, shares some items from his book and he vetted it. And then, of course, the whole reconstruction chapter, which in the third edition has been completely updated because there's been a lot of developments, was vetted by my breast reconstruction surgeon, Joseph Deza from Memorial Sloan Kettering, because I this year had my implants removed and replaced. And that was a personal decision. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of cancer is the gift that keeps on giving, right? So 11 years later, you have a surgery to change those girls out. Well, so, they, they, I, I also learned that they don't always last. That's one mm -hmm. reason. There's a sell-by date. In 10 years, you're supposed to have them reinspected. But coincidentally, the Food and Drug Administration issued a voluntary recall of all textured implants because there's a link to a very rare form of lymphoma, breast implant-related lymphoma. And when I found that out, I said, well, I don't want to go under surveillance for lymphoma now. Mm -hmm. I chose to have mine replaced and they're much, they're much happier. The girls are much happier. So what do you wish you had known before you went through this journey to Oz? I mean, to, yeah. And well, I mean, I know the book covers so much of it, but are there are a couple of really nuggets that, wow, I wish somebody had told me this. Yes, a couple. First of all, and it's the good and the bad and the ugly. And so anyone mm -hmm. watching this, I don't want to scare anybody, but this is a reality. I did not realize, you know, when you're going through, through cancer, you're a hero, you're a champion, you're putting your best <laughs> foot forward, you're, you're fighting, you're a warrior, all those words. Yeah. I did not expect the incredible depression and sadness, mm. post-traumatic stress syndrome that I experienced for about two to three years after my treatment, a sense of loss that was so profound that I walked away from my business. I didn't know what to do. And thank God I love to write because it gave me the time to write my heart out, mm -hmm. to share all this and say, I want people to know it's okay that you don't feel so great for a while. Because a lot of people are like, including my mom, Oh, just get over it. Move past it. Move past it. It's not that way. And it's not, and everybody's story is different, but I felt an incredible sense of um, not fear of recurrence, but this loss of purpose that I had to go refine again, because what I did before no longer brought me joy. Chemo brain. Whoa. Chemo brain knocked me for a loop. It was like having my brain cracked in two. And I couldn't, if I were looking at you, Molly, I wouldn't have known your name. And I'm uh, a creative. I was running a business. I kept running my business through all of this, which brings me to three. I chose to keep my diagnosis close to my chest, thus the title, Getting Things Off My Chest, because it took me two years to go public in my business community to have the courage 
to say, I had cancer, take me f as I am. I'm not back to where I am. I had to do it. I wasn't where I was. And it was definitely showing. And it took a lot of courage to say that out loud. You know, I was talking to someone earlier today and she was sharing that somebody in her company um, is reluctant to share their, their breast cancer diagnosis. And I said, understandably so, because um, we have had so many patients that we've helped share that once they tell their employer that they, their next performance review is affected and or their life is made a little miserable and they are either terminated or quit because because of this diagnosis. And while there's law around that, we have also seen um, where people are really intimidated and, and forced out. So it's, it's really a scary thing. And I think sharing that diagnosis is very personal. It is. And how you share it is very personal. I want to address the law. I actually mm -hmm. vetted that as well. Good. Adam Paskoff is a leading employee relations uh, legal expert and he uh, helped me with the whole chapter on dealing with this if you are employed with a company 50 employees over, under what are your rights? Mm -hmm. What are your rights under the Family Leave Disability Act? And what happens if you're self-employed? And a lot has changed in that area as well. In New York, for example, there's a Caregivers Act. And in New York, caregivers can now apply for aid while they're caring, if they have to take off work to care for their loved one. It's state by state, but that was a new development in edition three. So that, is, so really, and I have, I have, must confess, I've skimmed the book. I have not read everything, but the fact um, that there's good employment advice there and legal advice is very significant. And that's another, I would say a really important thing, know your, le your cancer legal rights because the laws can protect you. Exactly. Don't be afraid to ask. And I do say question everything. I questioned my oncologist ad nauseum. Molly, I had planned a trip to Asia for New Year's, my birthday. It's a tradition for me to celebrate my birthday somewhere wonderful every year. It's like I'm almost religious about it. And when she told me that I would have to have chemo, and this was November, I looked at her because remember, I was Miss Bossy Pants running a company. And I literally said, Oh, really? Well, I'm available in January. Can we get back? Can we can you get back to me after my trip to Asia? And she just looked at me and she said, Oh, we've got a lot of training to do here. <laughs> you need to learn to listen. So Melanie, can you share? Are you open to sharing your um, stage and, and type of breast cancer that you had? Yes. Did you grade? Yes. First of all, I want to underscore that I found the lump in my breast through a, ma a manual self-examination. I was 50 and I had no family history of breast cancer. So I was on a trip to Italy, a wine trip, because that was my job, and I was examining my breast and I felt a lump in my left breast. It was about three, three millimeters or so. When I came back to New York and my OBGYN said, I want you to get diagnostic testing, I ended up having three tumors in, my, in both, both breasts, which shocked me. I didn't know that when I went in for my core biopsy. When I went in, I thought they were checking one. And I got off the table and they said, oh, we forgot to check the other two. I'm like, what? And bottom line, I had um, lobular and um, DC, I had uh, um, in situ, I had every kind. I had, and I was stage 2A. And the breast surgeons, all three opinions I saw, it said, we advise you to have a bilateral mastectomy. I didn't argue it because at that point, I kind of, you know, they had cancer in both breasts. I wanted, I wanted it out. So I had no, I didn't fear that. I accepted that because I didn't see any other way out. So because you had chemotherapy, you must've had some lymph node involvement as well. Yeah. So I had a second surgery because when they went in and they did um, the sentinel node biopsy, um, they found I had some residual cancers in about five lymph nodes or so. So I went in for a second surgery um, several weeks later. My first surgery was like the end of September. And in, in October, I went in for another surgery and they removed a lot more lymph nodes from my left um, side. And I chose, I made the decision to um, start implant, uh, the whole process of getting implants. So they inserted, you know, the expanders in my chest. So I was already starting to go through the expansion process when I was going through my second surgery, actually. And then, and then, then 
uh, after seeking the consult of three oncologists, they unanimously said I needed chemotherapy. I did not want it. I wanted them to prove it and, and my health insurance allowed for three um, consults. So I went and they all said, girl, you got to get chemotherapy. You're going to have to do it. It's adjuvant, purely adjuvant. They wanted to prevent any risk of a spread of metastasis. So I just want to say that, and I failed to mention this, that um, our series in Facebook Live has been um, funded by a grant from Exact Sciences, the makers of the Oncotype DX test. And this test, if you have early stage disease and are ER positive, will determine whether you will have any benefit from chemotherapy. And so I tell people always ask about that test. There yes. is another test called the Mammoprint which is good for your genetic profile, but will not tell you whether chemotherapy will provide benefit. And as Melanie and any other woman would attest, if you don't have to have chemotherapy, you don't want to have it for no. lots of reasons. And, and I think that's a really important point, Molly, because uh, research and new developments are always happening in the treatment of breast cancer, even when, you know, long since I've been, was diagnosed in 09. So always ask what tests are out there now to see if I really need to undergo chemotherapy. It's different with the lumpectomy because you almost always have to have radiation. I did not have radiation. I actually was offered the choice to have radiation. <laughs> and I said, well, if you're asking me to choose, it must not be that terribly necessary. Mm -hmm. Again, three consults. No one could come to terms on do I really need it or not when the, they show me the percentages of how it reduced my risk even more, it didn't seem worth the risk of the side effects of the radiation. So I went from um, chemotherapy to endocrine therapy. So you did not have any family history, but you still underwent genetic testing. Can you share why you've made that decision? Yes. And what your thoughts are on genetic testing now? Well, I'm, I'm glad I did it. Uh, and the reason that my doctors advised that I had genetic testing and I listened is that I have an Ashkenazi Jewish background. Okay. And there is a, there is the gene does have a prevalent, a higher percentage in women of that background. And my father who died right before I underwent chemotherapy had a metastasized prostate cancer and his mother died of pancreatic cancer. So and there I are had, links to those through the breast. Yes, there are links to all of those. So mm -hmm. I went through genetic testing long after my chemotherapy ended. So this was like a, you know, like 18 months later, I underwent it. It was easy. And I did test positive for the BRCA2 genetic mutation. Wow. Yeah. So knowing that, when was the genetic testing? At what point after your treatment? Um, it was right around when I was in, I think the third part of my reconstruction, they wanted me to do it after I'd finished treatment and then I had to get it scheduled. I think it was almost a year after my mastectomy and I chose to have my ovarian uh, ovaries and fallopian tubes removed, the salpango oophorectomy so mm -hmm. that I didn't have the risk of ovarian cancer. I knew that was something I could do right now. And there was no question about it. I did not want to get ovarian cancer. That, that's amazing. Um, we're yeah. talking to other people about genetic testing and it, you know, the pre-viver who may have a mother or an aunt or somebody who had cancer and may be at risk and then young and would, might have to make decisions. So you really have done multiple things to reduce your risk. I'm actually under surveillance. I'm so concerned about pancreatic cancer since I have a direct link through my paternal grandmother mm -hmm. and her mother that I actually um, am working with a, um, get a pancreatic cancer specialist and I've uh, undergone surveillance and had, you know, I get ch checked regularly. Wow. So mm -hmm. I want to talk, we have just about seven minutes left. I want to talk a little bit about self-care during treatment. And, yeah. and I want to go to what all of us think about is this, how do you handle anxiety and fear of recurrence? Because we know that 30% of women diagnosed treated for invasive breast cancer, even non-invasive, like I had ductal carcinoma in situ, may have a recurrence 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years later. So let's start first with self-care. 
Well, first of all, I don't care how tired you are, get moving, go take a walk, get off the sofa. The more you move, the better you feel and your chemo ring will go away. Two, get plenty of sleep. <laughs> Three, stay hydrated. Drink lots of water, healthy broth and juice because when you're dehydrated, you um, your autoimmune system can be impacted. So important because drugs dehydrate you and eat a balanced diet. Notice I didn't say healthy, I said balanced because it should be, you know, two thirds of your plate should be fruits and vegetables. The other third should be a lean protein and work with a registered dietitian that specializes in um, oncology patients or ask your uh, medical center if they have a dietitian you can work with to help you devise a healthy balanced diet because poor nutrition and you may not want to eat, but you got to eat because poor nutrition can really reduce the effects, the good effects of chemotherapy. There's a lot of bad side effects of chemotherapy, but as somebody said to me is, think about it as cleaning out the toxins, not putting poison in. It's got to, you got to look at it as a cleansing of your body and you've got to have uh, the right fuel to support it, which is a good balanced diet. So does the book address specifically what you might eat and not eat very so detailed I, I i consulted with two registered dietitians and susan bratton who's the founder of saber health who's a who i've known for years um there's a huge huge chapter it's called chew on this and it covers diet food safety food handling which i updated a lot thanks to covid hydration options for hydration and even how to make mocktails so you don't feel you're left out when you go out. I, I had a friend who did a book um, called Pregatinis for moms who are pregnant. Well, a lot of the symptoms from chemotherapy are very similar when you go through pregnancy. And so I uh, had some recipes for mocktails to help with uh, queasiness, for example. Mm -hmm. Big, big so, chapter on that. So, you know, being a wine connoisseur, um, there is a link between alcohol and breast cancer. So I know that you did not dump the drink, so to speak. Did you modify your alcohol intake and, and what advice do you have around that? It's tough because I write about wine, but I also want to say I spit out a lot of good wine. Okay. This is, you know, I know there's a link and I know that I'm not perfect and neither was Julia Child who had breast cancer and lived to 92 and died of old age. So I say in the end of the book, I pray to her every day, JC, not Jesus Christ, Julia Child. God help me, I want a long life like you. I drink in moderation. Uh, I take smaller sips. I do have wine with food, but I'm not a. I'm not one of those, like, I'm gonna have wine before I go to bed. I, I try very hard to drink in moderation. The um, guidelines, if you do drink, are one five ounce glass or have two, two and a half ounce glasses. Um, it's okay to spit and drink better wine. If you're gonna drink wine, drink better wine. And I also do dry days. So, um, and my husband does it with me. So if we're um, doing some professional tasting, uh, we'll go dry for like a weekend and lay off. Um, but I grapple with that. And uh, I grapple with it a lot. But then, you know, you can't give up everything you love in life to stay healthy. You have to do everything you love in moderation. That, that's good advice. Mm -hmm. So three minutes, two minutes. Yes. Your recurrence and anxiety. How do you handle it? Oh, I take walks. Uh, when my, I know my triggers, my triggers are when I hear someone that I know has had a recurrence. My heart drops. Mine too. Or someone dies. My heart sinks. Mm -hmm. And I, I, like I do with all stress, I rechannel that energy. I get away from the screen, I get away from the news, I go out in nature, I go take a hike, I go walk with my dog, I get away from the news and wrap my head around something else. It's hard because you think about it, but mm -hmm. you got to rechannel all that energy into something else. I know for me that um, getting on a yoga mat with some soothing music and practicing some breathing really helps reduce anxiety for me. And there have been occasions when I would wake up in the middle of the night kind of gripped with, it wasn't necessarily fear recurrence, but something I was anxious about and I would- Oh, like pandemia? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and get on the mat and, you know, do some down dog and some mm -hmm. breathing and it was it was really great. Well, so, between my downward dog and my puppy dog, those are great. Downward dog yeah. and hug my puppy dog. And yeah. I also um, 
I get, I've had a lot of those sleepless nights. Uh, I try, do not drink alcohol late at night. Do not eat chocolate. It has caffeine in it. So try to stay away from anything caffeinated late at night or mm -hmm. alcohol so you can sleep sounder and get yep. all the technology out of the room and put yep. on earplugs. I like high, uh, I wear uh, sound, really good earplugs I found. And another tip is to wear an eye mask to really black out all the light. You know, I can't do that. I feel I have enough problem with face masks. So for me, I can't do that, but I do it with the earplugs. I found these great earplugs somebody sent me for when you're on an airplane. I can't even hear David snore. It's great. And also keep your room at a cooler temperature. Yes. I also, after chemo, I, I can't bear wearing turtlenecks anymore. I can't bear wearing flannel. So I tended to sleep in the nude. So Melanie, I just want to thank you so much. I think this book, again, getting a few things I'll off my you. chest, right? We'll share it together. A Survivor's Guide to Staying Fearless and Fabulous When You're in Treatment for Breast Cancer. And many tips just for general life. So $20. We the Pink Fund, by the way, gets nothing from this. But I, I just think, again. The Pink Fund is in here. Highly yeah. recommended. Yeah. So, you know, somebody says, so-and-so has been diagnosed. What can I do? Buy the book get a gift card for a Grubhub delivery or a restaurant and know that you have really provided peace of mind to an individual uh, who is really full of anxiety. And I just want to add, while it says breast cancer on the cover, about 75% of this book or two thirds could be for anyone going through cancer treatment because mm -hmm. it covers a lot of lifestyle management and the practical management of cancer and a major medical illness. Thank you so much, Melanie. It's great to be with you. And thank you for kicking off Breast Cancer Awareness Month with Pink Fun. Molly, a virtual hug. My yeah. last thing, I hope no one ever has to buy this book because that means breast cancer has been eradicated. Yes, that's right. We always say at the Pink Fund, when people say, what, what do you want to do? And I say, we'd like to be put out of business, but there's no need for us. Exactly. Yeah. Have a great evening. Take care. Thank you. Be mm -hmm. well. Good night. Good night.